the fact that so many of our churches today struggle over how to find unity within our diverse theological views, but moreover, how do we come together utilizing the Bible as our central text, but not telling one group of people to take their concerns and sort of shove them in their pocket and ignore them. So welcome back to Advent Next. Uh, today I have a special guest. He is the author of Say No to God. And I think it's an awesome book, not just an awesome book. I think it's going to be a revolutionary book in our space because I think it really speaks to the current generation. It speaks to kind of the desire to say, how much room do I have in this relationship with God to disagree with him, to to you know, to maybe have a difference of opinion. And we're looking at a history in this book that I think is really fascinating, a biblical history of people who said no to God and kind of what are the principles that are there that we can extract from the text. So I'm excited. I think there's tons of life applications here. I think there's fascinating insights. And so I really hope that you enjoy this episode and are just uplifted. Our guest, Matthew Corpin, is that how you say your last name? It's Matthew Cortman. Uh, the way sometimes Cortman. sometimes I'll say it's like um, the P's not pronounced, but it's not silent. So find the middle ground. Cortman. Cort Cortman. Okay. Yep, perfect. <laughs> um, so could you introduce yourself a little bit uh, to the audience and let us know who you are? Sure. So uh, my name's Matthew. A lot of people call me Matt. Um, I am a graduate of La Sierra University. I was raised a Seventh-day Adventist. And... I've sort of uh, lived my life um, consistently within the church in terms of it always affecting some very deep aspect of me. My mother mm -hmm. worked as a minister, um, and I was baptized by Mark Finley uh, when he had a Revelation of Hope seminar, and I've always been in that uh, area of ministry and theology consistently. Mm -hmm. But when I was a teenager, I kind of got apathetic, as a lot of teenagers are prone to do. You know, you sort of my version of it was I came to think that, well, if we have the truth and the truth is already discovered and I can learn it all from a Doug Batchelor uh, seminar for an hour on um, 3 ABN, well, then what's, what's left to really be excited about? You know, I already know right. what to watch out for. I've got the signs. I'm good to go. Uh, right. So the Bible really became basic instructions before leaving Earth. So then I just huh. sort of became apathetic, but then rediscovered uh, a joy for the Bible when I found out about biblical scholarship and how professors at universities aren't uh, just people who couldn't cut it out in ministry. They're the reason that ministers actually succeed. Uh, and when I gotcha. realized that, transitioning from just a lay perspective who thought, you know, televangelist equals Bible scholar to actually reading books like, you know, right. the kinds of works that John Peckham or other great scholars in the universities we have are publishing, then it made sense like oh this is really there's a lot of work still to be done it hasn't all been discovered uh, right. so then that encouraged me to go on to la sierra and then from la sierra to go towards yale and then from yale to my phd currently at birmingham I, i'm cu curious were you ever skeptical that kind of this higher education journey would like lead you into some type of heresy i think i think there's a little bit of distrust of higher education at some level that it kind of distorts the gospel did you ever feel that way or were you kind of just more enamored and like really saw the value of the work that was happening and in, in, in scholarship well my journey was a little strange in that regard because mm -hmm. i think like a lot of people do have that usually and and certainly I would say that when I grew up, I didn't have a skepticism towards higher education. I wasn't even aware that like Bible scholars were different than Doug Batchelor. I, mm. I literally conflated the two together. And, and I think right. there was just this assumption that there wasn't a major difference between these kinds of fields and what's involved in them. But for me, I read a book by uh, Bart Ehrman. It was called Misquoting Jesus, Who Changed the Bible and Why? And it was mm -hmm. like a very popular introduction to textual criticism uh, by a professor who used to be evangelical but became agnostic, not for anything to do with the Bible, but for different reasons. But um, he took a very uh, kind of no-holds-bar approach towards trying to discuss uh, this, these issues. And when he did, 
it really like shocked me because the information he was giving and I was double checking and, and looking up, it was all stuff that I'd never heard before. So for me, it wasn't, um, oh no, I'm skeptical of, of these people telling me these things. It was more, why weren't any of the ministers I grew up with telling me about this stuff? So That's like, so, yeah. but, but yeah. instead of letting that become like for some a, a sort of a thorn that like grows in you and then that makes you bitter towards the church or makes you upset about like, why wasn't, you know, how, why did it end up the way it did? So instead that just kind of motivated me to go, well, if I didn't understand how things were, then instead of being upset about that, maybe I could like spend most of that energy trying to now learn what I didn't know. So I just right. kind of like picked up my bootstraps and just like ran into the opposite direction to go, okay, so what has been going on behind the scenes? And then when I came to La Sierra, I realized, oh, great. You know, I already knew before that's the reason I went to La Sierra. Is, um, I was a little skeptical at the time about uh, Adventist uh, insular education. So like mm -hmm. I noticed that most of the universities um, currently, a lot of people have degrees from Andrews, which is not a problem. But when you're coming from my perspective, having just read that book and, you know, slowly starting to read through Hermeneia volumes and other biblical scholarly works, you're like, well, but I really do want to know what I don't know. So right. then I, I went to La Sierra because most of the professors have degrees from Harvard, Princeton, um, Graduate Theological Union and other non-Adventist institutions. So I knew, okay, they're Adventists and they were outside the bubble. So they yeah. know about all this stuff. I can like, they're going to have a perspective that can help shape me. And that proved definitely true. So for me, uh, instead of being worried, um, I just threw myself into it. Now with that said, right. by no means did I just like accept everything. So like one of the things that I was always consistently doing when reading is struggling over these issues. Like, it's funny because now I'm very comfortable with the documentary hypothesis and critiquing it, working with it. Uh, for those that don't know, it has to do with the authorship of the books of Moses. For those that do know, it's either right. the bane of your existence or it's like right. your happiness. JPD, right. Yeah. And, <laughs> but when I started that, I spent probably a year struggling with that. I was yeah. just like, just could not find comfort with it for the longest time. So uh, one of the things I consistently did in those early years is somebody says something, it bothers me, and then I try to work through, okay, how did they come to that position? Like, they're mm -hmm. stating this, but does the evidence actually suggest that, or is that an interpretation? Like, I really like details. I like understanding yeah. the puzzle. So um, It's almost I like think looking at the psychology of how somebody, how somebody's brain's how somebody's brain works and how they reason through the scriptures and how they get to, to where they are, it seems like. Yeah, no, and, and it's something you learn in scholarship, uh, the mm -hmm. difference between what the evidence actually says and then what is implied and what are the options, right? And, and oftentimes when scholars speak on a topic, for some reason there's just this tendency to just whatever uh, implication that you see becomes like almost the only one to the yeah. point where like, uh, take for example, historical Jesus books. Um, you know, there are so many versions of scholarly reconstructions about how to understand Jesus in his context. But if you read any specific portrait of Jesus in his context, they almost never reference the other scholars. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost always as if they're writing like, this is the portrait. So when you right. read so many of them, you know, you come away kind of dazed, like, oh my goodness, this one says it authoritatively this way, this one says it this way. And so to, the only way to understand that is to really dig into the details to go, okay, so what's the common stuff they're all looking at? And then how is it then from that they're making decisions to go in one direction or another? Sadly, right. that's not yet common for people to own up to like spelling out always, especially in popular works, exactly where yeah. they're coming from in that way. Uh, maybe yeah. it's sort of related to our need to preach and sort of the tradition of just <laughs> getting the sermon message out. But it drove me to really have a close eye, not only in regards to like the ministers who made me aware of, oh my goodness, why didn't they tell me these things? But also reading Ehrman and other works. Okay, why do you take it this extreme? Like, okay, I'm looking at the evidence. I looked it up. How did you go from that to that? Like, what was the process? So it helped train me in many ways, especially helpful for this book that I wrote, to really focus on what are the underlying presumptions 
that yeah. you know undergird how we approach scripture or how we approach the controversial topics? What is the core problems that drive our uh, debates rather than uh, focusing on what's commonly done is sort of the exterior little, um, how do you say, like road signs that people focus on, uh, but they don't focus on like, okay, but what direction are we going in? Like, right. they're just focused on the fact that the signs warning them or telling them left. But, but in general, where does that road seem to be heading up ahead? And where did we come from? Why are we yeah. here right now? Yeah, I think it's so key because I think especially, you know, we live in kind of a very educated society, right? Like most people end up going to college at some level, they have some type of college education. And I think that the type of church that we do nowadays isn't sufficient for the thinking mind, right? Like you said, you had this kind of moment where you were disappointed and saying, why didn't they teach me this? Or or is kind of the this lay uh, televangelist version of the gospel like the 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 most academic that there is and if so it's not really competing in the place of ideas like the rest of the scholarship that I've been exposed to and I think that as the education of our churches continues to increase especially of this generation like we have to be able to provide them with the tools and the insights and the know-how to begin their own journey and and to know that I kind of like what you were saying, you know, that you were afraid of going through insular education. Like you wanted to see what other ideas were out there. And I think sometimes people are afraid of what they'll discover. Um, And sometimes people just don't have the tools and they're worried that like, I might not have the tools to navigate this. I have so much going on in my life. I don't want to be stuck in an existential crisis for three months as I work through these theological issues that I don't know if I'll be able to make it to the other side of. And so there's so many factors why people People say like, I don't know if I want to deal with these ideas, but in the end of the day, you know, if taking the time to really wrestle through that, um, you know, truth is able to stand up against whatever. And so it seems like that was even kind of the, maybe, you know, some of the courage behind why you were able to write, say no to God. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about like, like what was some of the motivation behind this book? Cause it seems like that's kind of the culmination of a trajectory you were on. Definitely, I think one of the motivations that really drove me towards trying to write this work is the fact that so many of our churches today struggle over how to find unity within our diverse theological views. But moreover, how do we come together utilizing the Bible as our central text, but not telling one group of people to take their concerns and sort of shove them in their pocket and ignore them. Because Mm -hmm. essentially what we end up seeing is um, largely a divide, especially say in Adventism, uh, but certainly this is true for the larger world of Christianity, a, a divide over, I read scripture, I'm a dedicated Christian, I, I believe Christ represents and is God, his life, his ministry, it shows me uh, who God's character is, it shows me God in flesh. But then I read Joshua. Then I read um, uh, Joel, the second half. Then I, I, I'm reading what happens with Esther at the end of the book. Then I'm reading Nehemiah. Then I'm, re- you, I'm reading uh, the war codes uh, in Deuteronomy and, and Leviticus about what you should do or, or how to take slaves or, or what do I do with this? And unfortunately, what tends to happen is people are basically told God can do anything. Right. So that's not your place to question. Oh, no, you're doubting God. So then, you know, you've done wrong already. You've already started to sin. Don't go any further. Um, Or more relaxed, you know, oh, well, they're just, you can explain these things away if you just spend enough time trying to, to think about it. But, you know, you can reason as much as you want your conscience away, but at the same time, it's, it's still doing a certain amount of damage to your perspective, because on the one hand, you're living a paradox. You see something, and it speaks to as anti-Christian, but it's in your Christian text, and you're not being given an option for how to uh, sort of reconcile these in a way that makes sense to you. You're, in a sense, right. asked by others to adopt some other method of, allowing this contradiction to exist there and not notice it as a contradiction. So one of the things that this book really wanted to approach was the fact that there are these specific stories in the Bible and texts 
that really have not been utilized uh, within our conversations on inerrancy, on authority, on the Bible, just what is it, why do we have it? And yet these texts and stories, even within Adventism, have such rich possibilities and um, capabilities for expressing to us what it means to be uh, in relationship with God. What does it mean to be the people of God? So these are stories fundamentally in which you have characters in the Bible who uh, argue with God. Mm. They either physically or metaphorically are fighting with God. And mm. what we end up seeing, you know, most people, when they think about people who fight with God, they think of Jonah. Right? And they think of, okay, well, yeah, there's characters, Miriam, Jonah, the Peter. They say no to something that God's saying, and then God comes at them and says, no, you're wrong for doing it, right? Okay, right. good. Message is trust God. But then you have these stories in which the opposite happens. The human, like Jonah, says no, but it turns out their way. Mm-hmm. And it's not, it's not like Samuel with Israel, where, um, you know, God says, let them have what they want because, you know, they'll reap the consequence. Not, not like that. But they end up winning a result that, in the end, looks more moral or more just or more in line with God's character than what God had spoken in the beginning. Mm. So then this creates a, a, a dilemma. And unfortunately, most of the research that has taken place on this Uh, or discussions about it, both in Adventism and certainly in the wider world of Christianity, has been focused on the question of like open theism or related to how can God change his mind. So our focus has consistently been primarily on God and his ontological status. How does this work? But I wanted to switch the focus when I was in school, because that's when I was writing the book, was Mm -hmm. in the middle of my program at La Sierra. I I was taking classes on ethics and on biblical studies, and I wanted to switch the attention to why could the humans think that they could do what they were doing? Mm -hmm. What motivates them to tell God no, or to resist what God is saying, or to fight back physically in one case with God? What gives them the sense that that's both right, but also what about what they did seems to merit God's acceptance of it? Hmm. And, and how could that reveal a missing piece to a lot of the debates that we've been having? So that's really like the core of what motivated this book. Um, it's, it's more of a theological work, but it's deeply built on sort of taking a close exegetical look at right. what these Bible stories have to say. And I, and I love that. And I hope that you can get into some of the characters because I think that you know, maybe as a church, maybe as as personally, maybe there's been points in our life that, like you said, you know, what we have heard in cases where people say no to God, like Jonah or like other parts of the Bible, like uh, Miriam, that it's always like this act of rebellion and that it's something that God doesn't want. And it gives you a kind of authoritarian picture of who God is, um, that there's not space to reason with him. Uh, but he says that, you know, come, let us reason together. And in that sense, you know, if we don't have the right image of who God is, right, if we believe he's authoritarian versus we believe he's somebody that we can approach and say, I don't understand why you would say this. And I, and in my morality, I disagree with you, right? To know that he's a God that makes space for that, you know, actually invites relationship, whereas just the God who says, do what I say and don't question it, it is kind of this model of almost tyranny. And, and so many people, you know, as they begin to grow in their understanding, their own conscience, they're like, I don't know if I want to have a relationship with a God this way. Like I would, I want, I would hope that God would listen to me or that there would be room for us to discuss things. And I think anybody, you know, who has a sensible sense of what a relationship looks like would want that with anybody, right? So maybe you can walk us through some of the characters. Like what are some of these examples that you found in the Old Testament? No, absolutely. I, I do want to comment, though, on yeah. like what's interesting is that Isaiah text, right? In some Bible translations, they actually translate it, not just come let us reason, as though God was like a uh, Enlightenment scholar sitting down to have tea with you and discuss the merits of Kant's theory. But like <laughs> they'll translate like the New Revised Standard Version, uh, come let us argue it out. Like the mm. word in the Hebrew implies um, a very forceful engagement. This is, this is you in rabbinic school going head-to-head with your teacher 
uh, you may very well end up losing the debate, but the teacher expects that you won't pass the test unless you are going to give it your all. So I, I love that like sometimes people miss this. They'll, they'll be like, well, see, it's reasoning. It's like, mm. yes, but this is like hardcore debate reasoning. This is. Can I just say that I love that yeah. because I'm an arguer. Like I love, <laughs> I, I love a good argument and I, I'm such like a fighter in so many ways. Like I was, I was a wrestler when I was younger. Like I did kickboxing. Like I love physical things. So both physically and argumentatively and to know that like, God is inviting that type of interaction. That's just like, that's just everything for me right now. So. I'm glad. And then I think too, what's interesting about your, your comment regarding like what a healthy relationship is, right? Let's think about what an unhealthy relationship looks like. Since we live in a very uh, modern period now, postmodern, we're, we're seeing a lot more uh, problems in our society. So let's think about for a moment, like what does a relationship look like in which uh, and even more specifically, historically, in which a spouse is prized for submission, for, uh, you know, doing whatever the other major dominant partner wants. Right? I'm describing patriarchy, right? I'm describing right. Uh, a sort of very unhealthy, toxic relationship in which the one partner uh, is not partnering with uh, their other spouse, but rather dominates and controls them, right? And, and just about any Christian today, whether you're evangelical or you know, you're a progressive, it doesn't really matter. You're all pretty much, mostly. <laughs> there might be a, a couple sections still, unfortunately, but th for the most part, they're gonna look at this and say, yeah, that's not a healthy relationship. Uh, you know, I mean, um, also I think uh, there's a great YouTube clip where, uh, clip where Jordan B. Peterson is having a discussion about uh, marriage and he talks about this idea that like, humans are meant to contend and, and that we need to have partners who push us to become stronger because uh, not only would it be boring, but it's also fundamentally anti-human to not have somebody who is uh, forcing you to grow and become better. Uh, mm. No one likes that conflict. No one ever does. I mean, uh, none of the characters that I talk about in my book necessarily enjoyed the conflict with God. Nonetheless, it's what fundamentally grows and changes them and helps them to become better people. It's, it's like our human nature, or as um, Catherine Tanner at Yale argues in her systematic theology, uh, human beings, it seems like our major quality in existence is that unlike other things or other animals, right, um, an anteater does what an anteater thing does. And, you know, uh, a plant is what a plant is. But humans can't be pegged down. It's like our very quality is our instability, our ability to transform and change and constantly be adapting. So mm. the very idea of submission is like pushing us back towards everything else away from our very own humanity, as opposed to embracing what is really significant about humanity, about um, right. what it means to be human, and that is to be changeable, to, to wrestle with not only each other, but as I argue in the book, and I think the Bible teaches, God himself. So you, you wanted to know, like, what's a good story? So the one I usually think to go to that illustrates this best is probably Exodus 32, uh, 7 to 14, then Exodus 33 to 34. Um, and what you have in this story essentially is Moses is on Mount Sinai. The Israelites have uh, come down to the mountain. They're waiting for Moses to come back down. They're getting antsy. Of course, we many people know the story of Aaron and and uh, allowing for the uh, golden calf to be built down below. So yeah. God sees that they've built the golden calf. He gets really mad. I mean, there's, there's no two ways of how to describe this. It's just God is as pissed as he's going to get. And so he tells Moses and says, I am going to wipe them all out. I turn my back on them. I'm going to kill every last woman, pregnant woman, child, infant, wipe them completely out. Just going to murder every last one. And I'll restart everything with you, Moses. We'll just start with you as though you're Abraham again. And so uh, what he says very specifically from the very beginning is, don't try to prevent this. Stay away. Hmm. And, and it's an order. It's a command in the Hebrew. It's, it's stay back. Don't approach me. Now, what's interesting about this too, and I don't mention explicitly in this book. I am in the next book that I'm currently writing. But one of the major key elements of a prophet in the Hebrew Bible is that they are to stand in the gap between God and the people. 
Like this is over and over again emphasized. And Ezekiel, God condemns the prophets at that time because he says, you did not stand against me when I was giving my messages against the people. You did not try to defend them. You allowed, you accepted my messages of wrath, which means that the wrath now falls on you as well. Mm -hmm. um, so like there's this element and, and it's important because in the Bible, right, Moses is the prophet uh, penultimate. He's par excellence. He is the model. So every other prophet has to stand up to what this code of conduct is that Moses has laid out. Moses' decision to ignore God's words that say, stand back, don't approach me. He does. He, he ignores that, goes straight up and says, you can't do this. Right? Mm -hmm. So not only does he disobey the command, but he then tells him, no, you can't do the thing that you're saying is his will. And it's funny because in that moment, he's actually, even um, this is mentioned by Ellen White, he's, he's really fulfilling and proving his position as prophet, as leader of Israel. This is him fulfilling what every prophet must come to epitomize, care for God's people and recognizing that care for God's people equals care for God. But why or, would God, like, and just kind of to, to kind of interrupt you right here, why would God say something that he didn't actually want? Right. Like, wh why would why would he put Moses in that place? Well, right. So this is the, the, the very interesting tension. Is it what he wants? Is it not what he wants? So if, mm -hmm. if you're if you're of the mindset that um, the divine has uh, an omnipotence that does not know the future. And so it's changeable and malleable and it, and, and it can move in certain ways. Right. If you're a, you know, there's various versions of open theism. But, you know, a lot of them like this passage because when Moses argues with God and says, no, you can't do this, and he gives a bunch of reasons, which we should go into, but when he yeah. gives a bunch of reasons of that, it then says, and God changed his mind about the, the evil that he had planned to do. And so, you know, some people can obviously take that and do and say, okay, we'll see, God changed, okay? And, and some do it for the negative and others do it for the positive. Like, yes, see, this is the classic view of God. He can, he can uh, accept input. Uh, but the funny thing is, right, what does it mean he changed? Because when you read chapters 33 and 34, there's some weird stuff that's going on that doesn't fit into the model of God learned something. And so, like, for example, Moses' arguments, right, towards God are, you said this, you know, or put it this way, you can't do this because you'll break your promise, i.e., you've already said you're a promise keeper. Uh, you can't do this because people will think you're evil, because you're not evil. That's what you've established yourself as. You can't, do, right, everything Moses says in response to defend God uh, from doing this action is rooted in God. Or as John Calvin says in his commentary on Exodus, um, you know, uh, he, he reaches, he, he fights against God by reaching for God. Mm -hmm. And so what we end up getting in this portrait is an image of God having provided the very uh, tools that Moses needs in order to fight what he's saying. So mm -hmm. what we get then is God was this way. Now Exodus 32, 7 begins this like divergence. All right, something's happened here. And now Moses is appealing to who God has been in contradiction to who God is currently presenting himself in that moment. Hmm. But see, then that opens up an interesting question. Why is God diverging, right? And why would he then change? The change isn't actually changing God's character. The change, it turns out, is just returning back to who God has always been. So the hmm. question is, why was God diverging? from who he was? Why would he be just returning back to what is normal? When you go to Exodus 33, the, the debating keeps going on. Now it's a different debate. Now it's God says, I'm not going to keep going with the Israelites. I'm going to abandon you all. Okay, so it keeps on going and going and going. And eventually in Exodus 34, Moses just says, show me your ways. Like he's fed up. He's like, I, I've been fighting with you for two chapters to try and keep you being our God. Why am I doing this? Do I not understand who you are? Who are you? So what we end up getting then is the famous scene where God says, okay, move into the cleft of the rock. You can't see me or you'll die, but you can see my backside. And everyone remembers that image, right? And there's a lot of concentration on thinking about what that means. And there's great illustrations of it, like 
like some of the rabbinic scholars used to say, um, looking at his backside means you can only see where God has been. You can never know where he's currently. Um, Hmm. But if there's a speech God gives when he's passing by, and that speech is, I'm ever merciful, ever forgiving, ever loving, ever all these attributes that really don't match up to how he was in verses 7 to 14. Yeah. So what gives? Because mm. what we're getting here is God was one way. He diverged. Moses noticed the divergence and said, no, this isn't who you are. And then God affirms at the end to Moses' delight, I am exactly who you were defending. Mm. Which begs the question, well, then why was there a divergence? Why did you say something that wasn't seemingly true about you. And Mm. the answer that a lot of people through uh, the Reformation onward have given, and that's the answer that Martin Luther gave, John Calvin gave, Ellen White gave, that is the answer that my book proposes. God is testing Moses. God is testing him to say, do you know who I am? Do you worship me because I am Yahweh? Or do you worship me because I am a God? If I was no different than Marduk or Isis or anyone else, as long as I was speaking to you, would you just do whatever I told you? Mm -hmm. Is there nothing intrinsic to who I am that makes you like me as God, as opposed to just what I am and what that privilege gives you? Then Ellen White actually adds in beyond that the fact that had Moses agreed, it would have looked like he was valuing his own success as opposed to the people. Like, yes, give me all these privileges. I'll take them all uh, to myself and get all the credit uh, instead of suffering with and trying to help others, which would have, according to Ellen White, disqualified him for the sake of demonstrating that he, in fact, was not a worthy leader, that he had his Mm -hmm. own self-interests at heart. Um, But what's fascinating when you see this, this idea of, and it does match up with the text because God's not presented, even in the Exodus story, as being someone who is changing or someone who is, like, this is who he was always. It's Mm. this weird moment that's different. Why is it happening? But when you see that, it begs the question, what does this mean for people of faith? Like, if Moses can hear God say, don't do something, and this is my will, which contradicts what God has elsewhere said about his will, Right. Could we see analogies between what Moses is experiencing and what we as readers of Scripture experience when we are wrestling with descriptions of God in Joshua or Deuteronomy and descriptions yeah. of Christ in the New Testament? And that's sort of where my book tries to take things is helping us not only to notice these stories and what they're revealing, but also to notice how they're very applicable to our own current circumstances and debates we have. All right, so I don't want you to blink or you'll miss it. I think Matthew is hitting on a very relevant point, which we're going to unpack in greater detail in a few days on part two of this series, Wrestling with God. If you have to go back and give this last part another listen, I would encourage you to do so. I don't want you to miss this critical part of our conversation. I just want to say thanks so much for taking the time to listen in. Next week, we dive a little deeper into this conversation and hopefully provide some insight and inspiration for your own creative journey with Christ. If you're not already following us on Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram, be sure to do so at Advent Next. You can follow our guest today on Twitter at M. Cortman, and be sure to check out his book, Saying No to God. I appreciate all of you who have left reviews on Apple Podcasts or are engaging in the comments through YouTube. I really love hearing from you, so keep it up. If there's a future topic you'd like me to explore, please subscribe and comment below, and I guess I'll just see you next week.